but uh, today we're going to hop back into our series we started last week called Defiant Joy, and we're going to continue on in Philippians chapter 1, and, uh, and I, I told Amy as we were driving down um, this past week that as I've been preparing and studying um, for, for, this, for this series, God, I've continued to, I continue to be reminded of the faithfulness of God. Um, because it's interesting how in one season, as you write and you prepare, you're like, man, this is going to be good for somebody else. In the next season, I'm like, God, this is really good for me right now. And, uh, and so, so as, we've, as we walk through, and, and I know that in this room, there are many who have walked through a bunch of different things. And, uh, and you're walking through some things right now. And uh, we're trusting that God is going to meet you where you are. But Paul... Paul wrote this, and sometimes I'm really glad he did. Other moments, I'm like, Paul, why'd you have to put this in there? There are some mornings. I, now, I know, I know you probably think, well, Parker, you're a pastor, so obviously you have joy all the time. <clears throat> um, I, I, no, nope, nope. <laughs> Um, anybody else ever have to remind your face to let people know you have joy or is that just me? (laughs) Yeah. And we're looking through this book and again, Paul Philippians, as he wrote this, this is quite possibly the last letter that Paul wrote to a church, at least the last one that we have, that we have access to written probably around 60 years, 61 or 62. Um, and according to history, what we know is that year 80 is 65. AD is when Paul um, was executed. Um, So this is one of the last letters that he wrote. And as we read through this, you would think you were reading a letter from somebody who's sitting on a beach and is just, you know, sipping a a pina colada, virgin of course, but sipping a pina colada uh, on the beach and just enjoying life. But that's not his experience. Paul is writing this letter from prison. He's writing a letter in 20, and again, history would tell us that, that he is chained to a guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, again, according to, according to history in these days, every six hours, Paul's guard would be changed. He would be stuck there, but his guard would change every six hours. And yet, chained to a guard, stuck in a place, wrongly, wrongly imprisoned, and everything else he walked through, he writes this letter, and it's just like it oozes with joy. And he writes this letter, and you're like, I don't get it. This does not make sense. And, I, and, and it doesn't make sense because my, my lived experience isn't always that. I mean, if, here's the thing. If being a follower of Jesus, if the moment that you and I made a decision to follow Jesus, all of a sudden we were just joy-filled people all the time, things might look a little bit different, I, I think. But Paul wrote another letter to the church in Thessalonica, and he wrote, and I referenced this last week, but I think 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, uh, 17, 18, he says, he's, he says, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. If you were automatically filled with joy the moment that Jesus became a part of your life or you submitted your life to him, why is it then that Paul would have to tell you to choose joy? That's exactly what he says. He says, we have to choose joy. And it doesn't start in action. It starts up here. Remember we said last week, 60,000 thoughts is the average number of thoughts a person has on a daily basis. And, and of those, again, based on research, 80%, 48,000 of those are negative. Some of us maybe feels like a little bit more at times. And we don't have to tell ourselves to think negative thoughts. It just happens. And yet we have to choose joy. 
And if anybody can tell us to choose joy from experience, it's Paul, again, because of what he's walked through. I mean, I, mean, I just look at it again. Last week, we referenced this from Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. He starts the book out. He says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy. And that just, again, seems crazy knowing his circumstances. But he could be filled with joy because he chose it. Because he had one focus. And again, we said, again, joy comes, is determined by our mindsets. And, and here's the thing. Paul chose not just to look at what was happening to him, but he chose to see that God was working through him in spite of what was happening to him. He chose to say, oh, no, 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 listen, I want you to see how good God is. And, and, and here's why. Because Paul, did what, Paul recognized this about his life. His life and his joy would not be determined by the circumstances he walked through. His joy would be determined because of who Jesus was in him and because he was living for Jesus. And so he saw everything that he did as an opportunity for Jesus to be seen in him and through him. I mean, he'd been illegally arrested, beaten, slandered, humiliated in prison, and not just once, but over and over. And I can imagine his, his prayer being this, Jesus, use this to draw people to you. I live my life first and foremost to bring you glory. So no matter what I face, I count it as joy because you will be made known through me and through my suffering and through these horrible circumstances, you are still good and you are still God. I can imagine that being his prayer. It would have to be, it had to be something that I would have to pray over and over and over, especially if I was facing what Paul faced. But we look at this, and, and I want to continue on today, and, and, and we're going to read um, in just a moment from Philippians chapter 1, the next few verses. But as I said last week, I think one of the things that, that keeps you and me from really experiencing or living out joy as Jesus intended for us is that too often we see our identity as followers of Jesus as a secondary thing and not a primary thing. And this is what I mean by that. Uh, I think sometimes we see Jesus as an opportunity to enhance our life or make it better. And Jesus said, I didn't come to make your life better. I came to give you life, period. Amen. And too often we think, well, you know, we'll follow Jesus as long as it doesn't, as long as it doesn't get in the way of the other things that I do. Uh, there's the idea, um, you know, you can be either a Christian businessman or a businessman who's a Christian. Well, aren't those, does not mean the same thing? I, I don't think so. I think a Christian businessman sees his opportunity. One, he sees his identity first as a follower of Jesus. And so every interaction he has, every transaction that is made is an opportunity to allow Jesus to be seen in him and through him in the way that he does business. Whereas a businessman who's also a Christian can at times put transaction over identity and look at the dollar as more important than identity as a follower of Jesus. I read a story um, a couple of years ago about a businessman, a hotel owner in, outside of New York. He, his hotel was close to, I think, JFK. And, uh, his, and his business was, was good, and, and, but the thing that made the most money in his hotel was the bar. And yet he gave his life to Jesus and it began to change the way that he saw his business. And one night he was watching as he saw men and women who would step into the bar and would stumble out drunk. And he began to be convicted by the Holy Spirit, thinking, what am I doing? God, what are you doing in me? And he started wrestling with the idea, should I close the bar? And as he began to wrestle with this, he talked to a few patrons and they said, look, if you close the bar, we're not coming back. So it's your choice. You can either lose our business or you can keep it and keep what we want. 
But here's the thing. He recognized that his identity first was a follower of Jesus. Jesus had changed his life. And so he made the difficult decision and said, no, no, we're going to close the bar. We're going to put in an area where, where, where guests can come in and get food, get snacks, whatever else. He said, but I want to submit my life and even my business to the Lord. Fast forward one year later. Again, that he showed this, he showed the work of this, but in one year, his bit, he, was, he had 150% of the business that he did the year before without the bar. And I, no, yeah, it's incredible. The bar being right or wrong is not, is, not, is not the issue here. The issue is submitting who we are and all we have to the Lord. And when we do that, then we're saying, God, we trust you more than we trust the others and trust other outcomes. And I think that if you and I would actually live from that place, I think it would probably change some things in our lives. If, if we did that, it would probably change some of the language that we use outside of church. It would probably change some of the music that we listen to outside of church. It would probably change the jokes that we tell or listen to at work or at school probably change the way that we post things on social media. Can I get an amen? <laughs> or the way that we scroll. I, I think it would make overnight changes. Not because I think so, but because I believe that when we put Jesus first, that we live from a place where he is the center of what we do and who we are. It should impact everything. And that's what we see in Paul. That's why we can see this level of joy that Paul had. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn me to Philippians chapter 1? We're going to start in verse 12 today. Philippians 1, starting in verse 12. And uh, if you have that, I'd, I'd invite you to stand with me this morning as we read our primary text. And this is something that... I just believe it's a way for us to demonstrate reverence for, for the Word of God. And, uh, and so if you can, I, I invite you to join me. And uh, we don't do this for every text because it would get a little bit like uh, work and, and, and that's not what we're going for. But starting in verse 12, we're just going to read verses 12 through 14 this morning. This is Paul speaking. He says, And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, again, the life that we see lived by, by Paul. God, we read the words and we see his lived experience and we ask you today to speak to us through these words. And God, may you move in us and through us in new ways. We love you and we trust you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. <clears throat> uh, Horatio Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman in the late 1800s. And uh, he was a philanthropist. He, he was highly involved and engaged in his church. And he had a wife, Anna, and they had five kids, one boy, and they had four daughters. Uh, 1871, they lost their four-year-old son to scarlet fever. And just a few months later, the historic Chicago fire wiped out the majority of his real estate, his property holdings. And wrestling with all this over the next two years, they, they held things together and they saw God, his faithfulness to them through that. And at the end of that period, uh, they had planned a trip to travel to Europe. So right before he was to leave, some, some major emergency arose. And so Horatio sent his wife and his daughters across the sea. He stayed behind to finish up this business and then he was going to join them. And while they were at sea, another vessel um, ran into and sank um, the boat that Horatio's wife and daughters were on. And only his wife, Anna, survived. And when she arrived in Europe, she sent a very basic telegram that simply said, saved alone. 
as uh, he he finally he was able to joy. I, I I can't imagine the grief or the heartache that Horatio experienced when he received the news. As soon as he was able, he boarded a ship to Europe himself to join his wife. And as his ship neared the place where his family ship had gone down, he wrote the lyrics to a hymn that many of us know and have sung many times. The song, It Is Well. And when you think of that song, if I was Horatio, my song probably would have sounded a little bit different. God, where are you? Why did you leave me? How could this happen? And yet his words are, when peace like a river attended my soul, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever the lot thou hast taught me to say it is well. It is well with my soul. That hymn doesn't diminish the pain. It, do, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that anything else, or the hurt, the tragedy, but it proclaims that even in the midst of those that God is good. That he's present. That he's greater than the circumstances that we face. The story with Paul is a little bit different scenario than what Horatio Spafford walked through, but I still believe there are things that we see, correlations we see in Paul's life that would help us to see this. I mean, again, looking at verse 12, we read, Paul wrote, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything not just some things. Everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. If you want to know everything that's happened to him, you can read this week, Acts 21 through 28. Okay, just to give you, to give you a snapshot, here, here's the deal. He's arrested illegally because he, they thought that the Jews thought he brought a, a Gentile into the temple. Uh, the Romans thought he was an Egyptian renegade on the most wanted list. Uh, he was the focus of religious and political plotting and was a prisoner in Caesarea for two years before he even gets the opportunity to go to Rome. And oh yeah, while he's on the boat to Rome, his boat boat is shipwrecked and he spends three months stuck on an island waiting just to get the opportunity to appeal to Caesar. Kind of difficult situation. But Paul, again, had a focus from the get-go, from the time that he, that he, was, he had his Damascus Road experience. He lived his life in such a way that God would be glorified. And he said, God, I want you to be seen in everything that I do. He didn't find his joy in his circumstances. He found it in living for Jesus and pointing them to him. I wonder what would happen if, if, if I looked at my circumstances, both the good and the bad, in the same way. Uh, if I saw what I walked through as an opportunity for God to be glorified, for him to be seen, what difference would that, would that make? Uh, the end of verse 12, the last, the last the, the line there says, it says that he, he says it's helped us to spread the good news. And other translations, I read, I read out of the, the New Living Translation, um, uh, but other translations would say that it's, uh, it's used to advance the gospel or it's for the furtherance uh, of the gospel. And, and the word here that Paul uses is actually a Greek military term. And, and the term he uses there is one that like the army engineers, when they would go to a new area to explore, these were the ones who would go out ahead of the other soldiers to, to clear the way and to prepare the way. And that's the word that Paul uses here. He's not just saying, oh, I got to tell people. He's like, no, no, I'm blazing new trails. I'm going into people. I know that where I go, other people might not have the opportunity. A pastor might not make it into this room. 
But because of what I've said and what I've dedicated my life to, I, I, I can do that. Paul's not in denial. He sees it. Think about this again. Uh, most people would not have an audience with, with the Roman elite. But Paul, because he's having to, to, to prove or to, to appeal his case, he's getting to share the gospel time and time again with people who had never heard of Jesus. Paul, I shared a few minutes ago, the Praetorian Guard, every six hours, a new guard was placed there chained to Paul. Every six hours. That means every six hours, somebody else had to listen to Paul pray. Somebody else had to listen to Paul tell his story. And I can promise you, I can't promise you a whole lot, but I can promise you that after a while, some people gave their lives to the Lord because of what they saw in Paul's life. Paul saw that his life and his circumstances, he could, he's like, I could just get here and be sad like everybody else. I could just go through my life and, and, and just deal with it. Or I could recognize that even in the bad, God can be glorified. Even in the bad, I get put in places and in situations where God can be seen through me. Paul saw his life and his experience as an opportunity to blaze new trails. <coughs> How often do we view the difficult places like the doctor's offices in that same light? How often do we view our interaction with the nurses who are having to do the different things to get us prepared for surgery or whatever else, but as an opportunity to be Jesus. But those are the moments that you and I have the opportunity to choose. It's, it's, it's choosing joy. It's choosing Jesus in those moments. Paul said, I'm a trailblazer. I am a pioneer. I'm moving forward. And how crazy is it that although you might not be chained today to a guard, but you might have to walk through some difficult moments that even in those places, God could be placing you there on purpose. Hmm. I shared with the worship team this morning uh, a statement that um, a mentor of mine has said that's really it rings true, especially in this and in, in our lives recently. <coughs> she, her, she lost her husband a few years ago to Louis Body's dementia. And she walked through some just some difficult, a difficult season, but she made a statement that is just, I've held on to. She said, no, but she said, I chose to assign purpose to my pain. Pain was not good. She said her husband, her, her, her hero of more than 40 years as he walked through this, as there were days where he didn't know who she was. There were moments where she felt so alone and isolated. She said, no, 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 I choose to assign purpose to this so that God can receive glory through my life in the good and the bad. And I just wonder if, if what would change in our lives or in those around us is if we began to look at things the way Paul did. Paul didn't look at his life and think, I'm so glad that God let me be chained to a guard. He did not wake up in the morning thinking, how glorious is it to be in prison today? This is amazing. It wasn't his outlook, but it was, hey God, even in this, even right now, even in the tough things, you are God and you are with me and you can work in me and through me and whatever you got to do, God, do it in me so that others can know who you are. Isn't it interesting? It, we, 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 we assign different things. We look at pe different heroes in the Bible. Look at guys like David and we think about David and he used what? What did he use to slay Goliath? sling and, and rocks, right? When we, we think about that, or Moses had his staff, right? His staff was, was I mean, he, he, God gave it to him and, and it turned into snakes and eight other snakes and, and he used it. And it, 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 it's, and when he, when he held it up, it, it, it split the seas and he hit a rock with it and water came out and we see these things. And how crazy is it that the symbol that we get with Paul isn't something exciting like that, but it's chains, 
And what others would view as something to hold him captive, he viewed in such a way and said, no, 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 you might see this as holding me down. And yes, it stinks and I don't like it, but guess what? These chains are making it possible for these people to hear about Jesus. And if that's what it takes for them to discover who Jesus is and to find relationship and find life with him, then so be it. God, here are my chains. Use them for whatever you got to. Paul said, because of, he said, everything, everything that has happened to me has made it possible to, for the spread of the good news. I love that. And here's, but here's the, here's that key. Again, I go back to God can use your circumstances and your situation in the same way as well. If, if you choose to allow him to, if you choose See, Paul chose to let God be glorified in his circumstances. Paul chose to see his setbacks as setups for God to move. And again, verse 13, we see that. He says, for everyone here. I love this. He says, not just a few people. Listen, everybody, everyone here, including the whole palace guard, every one of them knows why I'm here. (laughs) everybody knows because I told everybody I told everybody I wasn't keeping it quiet if I'm gonna be stuck here I'm gonna use it there's gonna be purpose to my pain and purpose to my circumstances I will not allow the devil to control this because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world so these chains might be used to bind me right now but these chains are gonna be for his glory and I choose that today that's good stuff isn't it Mm. I think the chains in our lives that God allows in our lives can be seen the same if we will view them that way. And look again at verse 14, because of my imprisonment, I love this. He said, hey, because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. What was he saying? Hey, there are believers here in Rome. It wasn't popular to be a Christian in Rome in those days. In fact, it was something that for many would lead to them being thrown into, uh, into places where they would be just food for lions. And yet, because they saw what was happening in Paul's life, it gave them confidence that God could do something in them too. It gave them confidence. They saw that Paul had joy, and so that it, they said, hey, I we can too. If he can have joy being stuck there, why can't I have joy out here? They saw that God took care of Paul even in spite of bad circumstances. Well, God can take care of Paul. Man, I guess he can do the same for me. They saw God could use Paul even when he was in prison. Well, if God can use Paul there, why can't he use me where I am? This doesn't mean that they just started wearing like crazy, bold Christian T-shirts and they carried the biggest Bible they could find and they stood on top of tables and started preaching, repent! I mean, that's good, that's you, that's great. It also doesn't mean that they all of a sudden had to become preachers to leave their jobs, to leave everything they knew and, and go and preach. It meant that where they were... In the lives they lived, in their marriages, as moms and dads, in their jobs, where they were, they, would to, they were to be Jesus with skin on to people around them. Hmm. Think this morning if you had the same outset. Well, so and so, they might see that I'm sick, but I'm seeing where Jesus lets me be light. You might see this as a setback in my life, but I see it as a setup for God to move. You see the bad, but I see how God can and will turn it for good. There are countless stories in scripture of men and women and teenagers that allow God to use their chains. We could talk about Fanny Crosby. At six weeks old, was blinded, and it could have simply, as she grew up, she could have sat in a corner and said, well, life isn't fair I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. And yet she chose from a very young age that that, that she would not be confined, confined by the chains of her darkness. She became a force for God. And when she would go on to write gospel songs and hymns that we sing today, like Blessed Assurance. Songs like uh, To God Be the Glory. Songs like Draw Me Nearer. 
They didn't come from somebody who was going through life, just everything was great. They came through somebody who faced life that wasn't fair. Uh, There's a singer-songwriter that many of us heard today, Jeremy Camp. Jeremy Camp's story of, 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 of getting married and within a few weeks, his wife passing away. Left to under, trying to figure out, try to understand why would this happen? And yet, it's through that that he wrote the song, I Still Believe. Another story that, that I think is just is, is crazy, the story of, uh, the, of an evangelist out of Australia named Nick Vujicic. Let me show you this video real quick. Nick was born with something called Tetra Amelia Syndrome, and, uh, and it's a rare disorder that's characterized by the absence of arms or legs. You may have heard his story, but if not, check out this video this morning. I was born in Melbourne, Australia, 1982 and my parents had no idea that I was going to be born without arms or legs. I was the only one that I ever saw without limbs. My faith in Jesus Christ was sealed after seven years of wondering why God I was born this way. Uh, He answered me very clearly through John chapter 9. And I gave my life to Jesus at 15 after reading about how he came across a man who was born blind. And I'm like, hey, hold on a second. This looks interesting. (laughs) And no one knew why he was born that way. I'm like, perfect. So I read on and in verse 3 of the ninth chapter, Jesus said it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. And I'm like, wow, God, if you had a plan for the blind man, you do have a plan for me. And that was the beginning of my personal relationship with Jesus. Youth groups were starting to call me. Churches were starting to call me. Opportunities were opening up everywhere for me to share my testimony. I was speaking in front of 300 sophomore public high school students. Three minutes into it, half the girls were crying. One girl in the middle of the room started weeping. She put up her hand and she said, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but can I come up there and give you a hug? In front of everyone, she came and she hugged me. She cried on my shoulder and whispered in my ear, no one's ever told me that they love me. No one's ever told me that I'm beautiful the way that I am. I couldn't believe it, it changed my life. At that moment, I knew God was ministering to her through me. It's not by my speech or my power, it was God. And my heart was ignited with a passion. And it was an awesome day to see one soul transformed forever. That was when I knew I was called to be a worldwide evangelist. Today, do not leave here unchanged. Leave here unchanged. You don't know what God can do with your broken pieces until you give God your broken pieces. And I want you to know when you fall down, God's grace is sufficient. God's hand will come down and pick you up. And give you the strength to get back up. In the first seven years of ministry, God opened up doors for me to speak 2,000 times across 44 countries on six continents from university campuses, 40,000 students in China to India, where we're talking to sex slaves, to crowds in the jungle of India, 110,000 people, down to Indonesia and all of Southeast Asia to speaking at congresses of nations like Colombia and Costa Rica, where you see the leaders of that nation commit that country to the Lord Jesus. To Korea and speaking to the next generation about depression and suicide and to Eastern Europe where we did Serbia, Slovenia and Croatia. Then doors in the Middle East, the message of hope was spread throughout the whole Arab world. That is God. And we know We've just begun. If somebody had a reason to doubt God and be mad at the world, Nick would be one of those guys. But I love his reference to John 3. He says it wasn't because of his sin or his parents' sin. Jesus answered, This happened 
so the power of God could be seen in him. I believe that today there's some of us in the room walk, have walked in with our own chains, our own situations and circumstances that the enemy intended for harm. But that if we would choose to allow God could use so that his power could be seen in you. Amen. If we would choose. I want to say very clearly that choosing Jesus choosing joy does not diminish the weight of what you're walking through. It doesn't change the difficulties that you face. It doesn't make them any less. But it's a choice to say that God, in the midst of this, you're good. And if you can use my chains today, I give them to you. If you can use the difficult season I'm walking through, I surrender it to you today. Big so what for you today will be on the screen. It's really sad. joy is found when I choose to focus on Jesus. Would you stand with me across the room this morning? I'd like us to do something this morning. Because there are those of you in the room who have very real chains, if you will, very real difficult situations you're walking through, very real circumstances that the enemy would love for nothing more than for you just to be bound by those. But I believe that God wants to speak life into you, that he wants to help you see the purpose or that purpose can come through that pain. And I want us to take time this morning to pray together, to gather around the altar and just allow God to move in us. For some of us, there's a grieving process we're walking through and we want to grieve with you. For some, we're not sure. We almost feel like our life's been turned upside down and we don't know what side is up or what side's down anymore. And we're just saying, <laughs> I don't even know. But God's present even there. And so I'm going to pray. And after I pray, I'm going to invite you to come and find a place this morning. Finding a place doesn't mean that, okay, everything will be fine when it's done. But it's an opportunity for us to choose to focus on Jesus in the midst of the, of the stuff we're walking through. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? And God, I'm grateful to know that no matter what I walk through, I don't walk through it alone. I'm grateful to know that, God, what the enemy would intend for harm, God, it can be an opportunity for your power to be seen in me and through me. You command us to grieve with those who grieve, to rejoice with those who rejoice. Today, God, we want to do all of that and more. We simply want to start by focusing on you this morning. So God, I pray for those this morning who, who feel weighed down by everything going on in their lives. 
God, I pray that you would help them to see you and experience your grace and comfort in their lives as never before today. God, for those who feel like they keep getting every door just closed in their face, they're not sure what to do next. God, I pray today that they would see that even in the midst of that, that you have not left them, but you are with them. That they can rely on you. They can lean on you today, Jesus. God, today we want to choose to focus on you. So I pray for every heart. I pray for every life. I pray for every person. That God, you would help them to set their eyes and their focus on you. And if there is a person this morning who's walking through this, but walking through it alone because you've never put your focus on Jesus, I pray right now in this moment, God, I pray that you would allow them to see you. That God, if they would simply cry out to you, God, that you would forgive them you can heal them. You can restore their lives. God, I pray this morning that they would sense, you, sense that today. So this morning, amen, sorry. If you'd like to, if you need to find a place here just to pray and to process and to grieve, to put your focus on Jesus, to ask God to help you to see the purpose and in, in what you're walking through, then I'm going to invite you to come. Just find a place. We want to pray with you. We want to believe with you. And so right where you are, if you're, I, I would just encourage you, I'd invite you, join me down here at the altar. And let's, let's seek God together. And let's trust him to meet us here today. It is well today, Jesus. Doesn't mean everything is good. Doesn't mean everything is okay. But God, we know that in the midst of it, you are with us, that you have not left us, and that God, you will go with us. And today, God, we want to choose to focus on you in the midst of what we face. We choose to focus on you today, Lord God. Help us this week to walk that out. Help us this week, Lord Jesus, to trust and to know, God, that you are with us. We thank you for it. It's the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. My prayer for you today and for this week is that you would choose to focus on Jesus, that in the midst of what you walk through, you would know you don't walk alone. That you would sense the presence of Jesus from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. And that people around you will sense Jesus in you. May you be covered in his grace and his presence everywhere you go. God bless you this week. Hope you have a fantastic Sunday. Hope you sense God's presence. May the rain that we felt last night just be a foretaste of the rain of his spirit in your life. Be blessed in your coming and your going. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.